Hey Cornerstone, this is a special announcement for everyone who watches online. The South Wyoming and Heritage Hill YouTube channels are going away, but don't worry, starting the first weekend of August, all three campuses will be live streaming from the Cornerstone Church MI YouTube channel, which was formerly the 84th Street YouTube channel. We're making this change to simplify where people find us and to easily allow everyone to see all that Cornerstone has to offer in one place. One church, three locations, everything on one channel. To find us, search for Cornerstone Church MI on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new videos or live streams. For those who don't use YouTube, you can still watch online at cornerstonemi.org forward slash watch or on the Cornerstone app. Subscribe today and thanks for watching. All right, so listen. What's the best party you remember going to? Yeah, that one from that one time is in your head right now, isn't it? <laughs> well, look, mine's honestly is pretty simple. It was my 11th birthday, and I invited five of my best friends over to uh, eat pizza, play Halo all night, pretty much not sleep. <laughs> but this story isn't about me. In this story we're looking at today, Jesus is walking along, and he sees a tax collector sitting at the table. See, back then, tax collectors were not very well liked. They showed up at your door and said, money please, yeah, it's time to pay up. And the people hated tax collectors. Imagine if it was like that today. The IRS rolling into your driveway, trench coat, sunglasses, looking like Neo from the Matrix, what, with a briefcase, and a bill for all the taxes you owed for the whole year. That would be awful, but that was their reality. And out of all the people Jesus chose from, he called this tax collector to be his new disciple. Can you believe that? Well, the tax collector is so overjoyed that Jesus would even consider him. He throws a party and invites Jesus. I mean, I know Jesus is nice and all, but would you go hang out with people that others didn't like very much? Would you put your reputation on the line? What do you think Jesus does? Hey, let's find out together. If you're a guest with us, uh, you're probably thinking, hey, do they do this every week? We do this well through the month of July. We uh, value highly our Kidmen here at, the, at Cornerstone. And so we just allow all of our many, many kids workers to be able to take the month of July off. And it's wonderful to be able to worship together. And so we have a high value in family worship in this way as well. So it's really cool. So with a the theme of party, you may be thinking, party, this is crazy. What, what are you guys doing? It's a church. Like, you guys are supposed to be not fun. But we can, because what we're learning as we've been studying, do you realize God parties a ton? So the first couple of weeks we learn that God loves a good party. And God's type of partying is different than the way you may think of parties. God's way of partying, like in today's world, you have so much stress, you say, let's party to forget our problems. But God's party says, I want you to remember the ways I've been faithful so you actually fall in love with God more through a party. And last week we saw God will throw a party for one. And when you understand your value and the significance of who you are, you can walk into any social setting and feel confident because you've got the power of the Lord flowing through you. You can literally have confidence in any circumstance, even some awkward parties. Well, today, as Keontae was saying in our video, that today we're looking at what kind of party would Jesus show up to? That's interesting to think about. And who would he invite to the party? Have you ever not been invited to a party? I, I bet you have. In fact, social media will frequently rub it in your face. Like you may look at, be scrolling through your relaxing the normal moment and stuff. You're like, hey, didn't I go on vacation with those couples last year? And now they're posting these, all these pictures. They, they didn't invite me. That's horrible. Back in my day, I didn't have social media, so I never really knew, but sometimes I'd be sitting at the lunch table, and suddenly I would hear, hey, that was fun the other night, and I'm like, what's going on? What'd you guys do? And it was just a horrible feeling. Or I was in the day when we didn't all get participation trophies, and we didn't have an A and a B team for basketball, and the year in fifth grade when I didn't make the team, I was like watching my friends play all this great basketball that year, and I was loaded with jealousy. I wasn't invited to the party. I mean, it hurts. By the way, I made it the next year and beat out all those guys. It was great, but then, then didn't do well after that. But I had a great sixth grade. It was phenomenal. But it hurts 
to be excluded, doesn't it? The question is, if Jesus has multiple invitations to a party, which type of party would he choose to go to? And who would be invited to that issue of exclusion? This may surprise you, but the opening concept as we turn into Luke 5 in where Keontae was just telling us we're headed today, Jesus' VIP list is scandalous. Who Jesus would invite to the party may not be who you would think Jesus would invite to the party. So we're going to turn there to Luke 5, and I want to take you into this story. It's, it's pretty intense when we watch this. So Luke 5, and I'm going to start at verse 27. Jesus went out, and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, he left everything, and he followed him. Before I go further, isn't that interesting? It's always fascinating to me when somebody is invited to follow Jesus, there are many stories in which they just drop everything and follow him. I mean, isn't that just weird? Would you do that? I mean, genuinely, if somebody said, hey, come, come on, and you're like, okay, you drop everything, and you just follow. That's exactly what Levi did. And you're probably like, really? Did he do that? Well, they were living in a culture where that was a common practice, so it may have been that he just dropped it. It may be, because Jesus does teach, count the cost, that it's not written down that they debated and talked about it a little bit, but there's really no evidence of that. It does seem that Levi just started following. But then Levi actually starts kind of going public with this, and that's where it gets interesting. Keontae started to allude to it in the video that we just showed the tax collectors were very, very, very much hated. And here's why they were so hated. They were Jewish people that would come and tax their own people. It'd be like your family taxing one another. But this person was under the authority of Rome, and Rome was okay with them saying, let's say Rome said, you have to tax everybody 10% or 15%. If you want to increase that number and pocket the rest, Rome could care less. They just want to get their money. So if the tax is at 15%, or maybe it was 20 or 30%, and they now charge you 40%, and they pocket the money, and then they come to family dinner or a big party at your house, you'd be like, get out of here. I know you're, I know you're increasing the value. I know you're, you're lying to us. So tax collectors were known for being liars. They were not liked. They were traitors, if you will. Kids, think about if you were in the lunchroom. And when I was in, in uh, elementary school, the first time I kind of encountered a bully, uh, his name was Mike. I won't say his last name, just in case he's repented of this. <laughs> and he's a good man now. But he was a bully, and he loved to punch people and take kids' lunch money and Every time I saw him, I would avoid him. And so if he was down the hall, if you ever had that anxiety kick in and you just kind of, I would avoid whatever I could because I was like, I don't want to get punched in the face by this guy because he was a hot head. He was a mad, angry man. Imagine he's sitting at the lunch table and Jesus shows up and hangs out and sits next to him and says, this is my BFF. I'd be like, I ain't following you, Jesus because I'm not going to hang out with you when you hang out with people like him. That's what it was like when he said, come on, Levi, follow me. I can imagine the rumors and the gossip around town as people said, really? You're inviting him? And now here's where it gets interesting, because Levi goes public. He throws a party. You maybe heard us talk many years ago, we talked about Matthew party, this, and his name is Levi, but his name is also Matthew, it's the same person, and so he throws a party, and I want to read it to you, the very next verse, verse 29. Then Levi, Matthew, same name, held a great party, banquet, dinner for Jesus at his house, and here's, look at this, a large crowd of liars of tax collectors, and I keyword here, and others. Le uh, the, the, the gospel writer Luke is writing this, and he writes, tax collectors and others were eating with him. Who are, the, who are the others? Well, we know for sure there's a lot of tax collectors. And there's literally, Jesus should not be at this party, but he's at this party. And he's seemingly unashamed. 
And they're all gathered around, and it's, it's, it's a big deal. Everybody knows. You, you know, I mean, we'd think, well, they didn't have, they didn't have posting, and, and they didn't have social media and stuff. People talked. Back then, they talked just as much as they talk today, and they found ways of communicating. And so gossip would spread and be like, Jesus is at a tax collector party right now. I can only imagine his reputation is just being tarnished. Have you ever done that? You show up at a party that you're like, uh oh, I didn't realize this was going to be that type of party. I shouldn't be here right now. And you feel instantly awkward. Or maybe you've accidentally hit like on a post and you didn't realize <laughs> it caused a lot of tension. And you're like, I didn't know that would make everybody mad. And now everybody's frustrated. And it's like, because in life, there are your people and there are those people. That's not the way I'm saying it should be, but that's the way it is. And that's the way people behave. And that's the way people kind of congregate against one another. And that's exactly what happened here. Scandalous, if you will. Jesus hangs out with these people. The tax collectors and the others. I mean, this is why I love the scriptures, because Jesus can relate he can, he can so relate to us when you feel like, I'm not comfortable in this situation. What do I do? Well, I hope to give you some perspective as we talk about this today. Verse 30, again, continuing. But the Pharisees and the teachers, so the religious people off here looking at the party, the Pharisees and teachers of the law who belong to their sect, to their group, complained to Jesus' disciples. And look at how they complained. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors? And what was the original word? Others and sinners. That escalated quickly. Instantly, they are judged as bad people. They are tax collectors and sinners. It's interesting, this phrase, tax collectors and sinners, shows up seven different times in the New Testament. And every time it shows up, it's the Pharisees, the religious people, church folk, talking about those people. And let's say we, if we are the religious people, hopefully we wouldn't be as grumpy as the Pharisees, but I bet some of us are from time to time. I have a hunch because I've, I've heard of it occasionally. <laughs> Those people. And Jesus is hanging out with them. This idea of tax collectors and sinners is actually um, quite an interesting phrase because every time it comes from the Pharisees teaching on it, it, ha it leads us to ask the question, who are these? And this gets very personal as we, as we get into this now. The tax collectors, as we've just talked about, are Jewish people who were traitors, if you will, and joined Rome to kind of pocket some money. And not all of them were probably shady, but that was their reputation. So those people, the tax collectors, hanging out with Jesus at a party, and others, and them calling them sinners, because it comes from the Pharisees, most scholars believe that the idea of sinners is actually Jewish people who know the right thing to do, but don't always obey the law. It could be as simple as they're eating bacon at the party. Or it could be more extreme. Some have talked about prostitution or things that can be much more morally tension-filled. And so you have some people that know the right thing to do, but they don't do it. So I'm trying to say it may not be people who are just thieves and, and people who are atheists and hate God and want nothing to do with God. These are very possibly and very likely believers in God, but they don't do the right thing. Let's put another word to it. Hypocrites. There's a whole bunch of hypocrites hanging out with Jesus. And here's where the, the tension builds up. If the Pharisees had heard G that Jesus was at the party preaching hellfire and brimstone, repent for your sins are awful, then it seems to me the Pharisees would go, that makes sense. And they would probably say, hang in there, Jesus, sick them. That's what it would seem to be. There, there would be tension subside. But here's the tension with this story. Jesus seems to be having a good time. Jesus seems to be enjoying the party. 
There's no evidence of him preaching. It's interesting, if you read Luke, and Luke, the, the, the writer of this story, the writer of the Gospel of Luke, is very detailed. He's known as a physician, a doctor in that day, and so he was very detailed. I've never met a doctor who's not detailed, and they don't write well, you know, but they, they're very, very um, meticulous. And Luke talks about Jesus in a story just before this story, and it shows him telling them, repent of your sin. And right after this story, Jesus talks about repent of your sin. But when we get to this story of Matthew's party, Levi's party, not a word is spoken. No, repent for your sins are bad. Jesus just seems to be at the party. And there's probably tension galore with the people outside. And we know there is because of the way it's worded. So Jesus is hanging out at this party. I, I'm not one to love cliches. I think cliches oftentimes box us in to a worldview that isn't always accurate. But this cliche is very true. And this is at the heart of what I'm trying to communicate today. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. It seems to me that Jesus is at this party just enjoying them as people. And that's a lesson for all of us. There's a time to preach, absolutely. Jesus absolutely has an agenda to bring them to repentance and faith in Christ. Uh, there's no question, that's always Jesus' agenda, to bring them into relationship with God, to help them on a better path of life. But we don't see any evidence. And Luke, you would think if this was a big preaching moment, he would write, and Jesus said to them, Repent for your sins are going to hurt you. But Jesus doesn't say any of that. It seems he's just enjoying them and their friendship that is budding and, and blossoming in that, in that party. Huge, interesting lesson for us to consider. And I'll, I'll bring it to a focus in just a moment. But Jesus eventually does preach. But guess who he preaches to? He preaches to the religious people. And because they start complaining and, 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 and listen to how it's worded. Uh, listen to this very next verse. And to, to get to this, um, just think of a, a doctor as he describes this next verse. He says this, uh, and doctor of old. I'll explain what I mean as I get there. Jesus answered them, verse 31, answered them, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous. I have come to call sinners to repentance. But he's not saying that to the people at the party. He's talking to the religious leaders. He's saying, I've got a clear objective. But to make it really clear, for the past hundred years, most all of us don't really understand how it was to live prior to hospitals. But hospitals have gotten, they were popular in different eras in, in history. But for the most part in human history, the doctor would go to the home of the sick person. We are blessed to have ambulances and the ability to be able to drive to a hospital. You don't have to walk there. But when you didn't have transportation, it was really rough. The doctor would frequently come to the place of, of the sick person. And it almost seems like this is at play here. Jesus is going to them with a purpose in mind. And I'll summarize it this way. Jesus put his reputation on the line to deliver an invitation. He didn't expect them to just come to him. Jesus entered their world. He got to know them as human and as potential friends. And I'll talk why I share friends in just a moment. But he met them in their world to invite them into the world eternal, his kingdom. But Jesus was witnessing to all of us and he was saying to the religious leaders and to, frankly, anybody who would listen, he was saying, I have a strong agenda. I'm gonna go to them. I'm not here to preach to everybody who's living the right way. I, I'm trying to help others who are living in a way that's gonna hurt them. That's ultimately our goal here at, at Cornerstone. That's, that's half of, that's frankly all of our mission, but you've heard our mission statement many times. It's on the back of the walls of each of our campuses. To, at Cornerstone, our objective is to know Jesus and to make him known. 
So frankly, every sermon we ever preach is how to help you get to know Jesus better or how to help you love and care for people better. You'll never want to hear me preach again because I only preached, he only preached two sermons, always. It's always the same thing. Knowing about Jesus or making Jesus known to other people seems like, a, to me, a really incredible purpose and passion. And now, think about the purpose of church and our gathering here. I think when I say church, if I were to, like all the kids, if I were to have you draw a picture of the church... I bet most of you kids would draw a little steeple with a cross at the top and you'd put the doors or you'd kind of think here, you know, the kind of steeple in church and here are the people here in the church. Uh, oh, that's, I messed that up. That's, stay on your notes, Ken. Stay on your notes. <laughs> but these are the people. But you draw a building, right? You would draw a building, exactly. But that's only one-seventh of our week. The church is actually... Us, everywhere. If you're following Jesus with your life, God says the Holy Spirit fills you and you become a piece of the temple of the Holy Spirit. You become a temple of God. Like everywhere you go, we are the church. Now, what does that mean exactly? It means six out of seven of our days are spent out there in the world. I'll say it this way. I heard a wonderful quote that the church actually gets it upside down. We think that one day we are gathered together as the church. That's actually not true. We are actually gathered six days a week on mission connecting with the world. So we are six days gathered on mission connecting with people, hanging out with Matthew parties and Levi's and people where they're at, doing life with people, and then one day we have Sabbath. One day we are scattered away from the world and we are scattered into a little clump in all of our local churches. And we get a chance to go, oh, it's rough out there. <laughs> Whew. And you get a chance to be refreshed. And we get to sing and we get to see kids sing and we get to dance together. We get to, to hug one another and love one another and care for one another and listen to one another and cry with one another and laugh with one another. We get to support one another. And then we get to go back in and be on mission again and connect with people. The truth is, you may be, again, another cliche, but you may be the only Bible some people ever read. Let me say that again. You may be the only example of Jesus that some people ever see because they don't have a relationship with other Christians, potentially. And that's what Jesus is modeling for us when it comes to a party. He says, I just want you to enjoy getting to know people and doing life with them. And when they trust you and build a relationship with you, you may have an opportunity to offer the testimony of why you follow me as you follow Christ with your life. That's an incredible framework shift in our mind if, if you're willing to really take that to heart. You are potentially the only example of Christ somebody will really be open to because of the natural relationship and friendship you have. I'm jealous of so many of you because you get to do life with people I will never meet this side of eternity. You have the privilege of interacting with people that of all walks of life and together as we gather out in the world, we get a chance to really love in a way this world is craving. Because you know the tension in our world is because people are lacking love, real godly love. They're lacking the, the spirit of listening and they're missing the spirit of respect and care and nurture. And again, like what, we, what Tommy talked about last week and, and Marcus and Alex at the other campuses as we shared this idea of Jesus would leave the 99 for the one and then he threw a party when he found you that's the power of Jesus saying, when I fill you to overflowing, you get filled with a sense of love that only God can give. And then you're like, I can offer that love to the world. And frankly, we should, because the world needs to feel your presence and your connection and your unconditional love. Just to enjoy them as people, not walking in saying, hey, hey, there's a bunch of hanky-panky going on in here. And to walk in and say, yeah, I may be uncomfortable, but the greater is the spirit of God in me 
that, than, than the spirit of maybe darkness that might be happening in this situation. And so God, may I be the light in this situation. That's what Jesus was doing. He was the light in the darkness and he was loving on these people and they felt his love. And that's exactly what God is calling each one of us to do as well. And so parties aren't to be something we're afraid of. They happen all the time. We have social gatherings all around us throughout any given season of time. So I'm saying, be present and truly enjoy the people you're around. Don't bring the castman of judgment on them. That's not your job. Your job is to meet them where they're at. And then when they listen, you can, you can share the love of Christ and, and, and compel them to you. Here's why I get into that, and I want to give you one last verse, and I have to flip over two chapters, but in Luke 7, Jesus actually labels himself, and Luke writes it very clearly. Here's Jesus' label. He is known as a friend. That's the key. Jesus' word, I am a friend of tax collectors and sinners. That's powerful. Now for me, this concept is extremely personal, this week in particular. Last week I, I had the privilege of um, my sister doing something kind of crazy. Um, she uh, invited my mom and me, um, at, and we were going to do this two years ago before my dad died. We were going to go on a family nostalgic trip, the four of us. We were going to go visit all of our childhood homes. And so we did that last week, and I uh, got back last Sunday, and we traveled, uh, we started in DeWitt, and uh, before, yeah, this is the home that I actually learned how to walk in. I lived in that house for one year, and it was a brand new house when we moved in. It looks dilapidated like me, 50 years later. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we went to DeWitt, uh, which is where I was for 12 years, and then we went to Fargo, uh, North Dakota, which uh, way out to Fargo, and it was phenomenal seeing. And then we went to Rockford. I didn't put a picture of that, but the, here's in the Rockford house. Wanted to show this picture. Um, this uh, uh, my bedroom has been turned into a closet, <laughs> which st started all sorts of fights between my sister and me because it never dawned on me. She got all the bigger bedrooms all the way through. But it was very fun because, so what we did, is she was inspired by the TV show, This Is Us. They did this, if you ever saw this on NBC, it's one of those shows that all the emotions, have you ever see the color wheel of all the emotions out there? We hit all of them in, in that show. And This Is Us is just about a family and all the family dynamics. And they did this in their story. Um, they went and uh, did a tour of their history just to reflect. And so we did this. We spent an entire week and um, watched probably 20 or 30 VHS tapes, like real VHS tapes. We didn't trans, trans, uh, move them over to uh, uh, any kind of uh, digital. We read uh, tons of letters. We went through um, all sorts of journals. In fact, uh, it got really complicated um, as we were reflecting on so much stuff, there was one time my sister and I were in the food court in Illinois and we were just yelling at each other because so much was coming up that we didn't know that I had hurt her and she hurt me and we had carried this stuff and we have a pretty good relationship. I mean, we're pretty healthy. Apparently not. We had times of tension like crazy. And, uh, and it was just awesome to reflect back on it. And I hadn't done that in 30 years to even reflect on any of this stuff. And it was powerful. All five of the homes let us in. We did a cold call knock on, on most of them and all five houses let us in. And they were like, hey, it's amazing. And, and they showed us every square inch. And it was crazy how small the houses were and um, how different things were. Seeing some old friends, it was fascinating. But here's where it got really personal to this story today. Um, one of our times driving back, um, back from Fargo back to Michigan, uh, my sister was just reading my journal that was dumb, dumb, dumb on my part. <laughs> and it was my journal from 15 years old till 22. Those are prime time years to, well, this, this is what I look like during those times. <laughs> yep, that was my peak of coolness. <laughs> Business in the front, party in the back was legit. I had the gold chain that turned green, so I, I had the whole kit and caboodle, right? So that, that, this is me during those years as I'm writing this journal. So picture that. You can take the picture away very quickly here, and we don't have to look at it anymore. <laughs> Nate, you can take that picture away right now. 
but here's where it got tricky. Uh, it was about a four-hour stretch. She read my entire journal out loud with my mom in the back seat, listening to everything. Oh, you're guilty of your life too. Apparently, you have a lot of stuff to hide. And I had no idea what was going to come out. And yeah, there's a lot of embarrassing things. Absolutely. But I did learn one thing. I was not nice at times. I was not nice. I had a sarcastic, mean spirit. But this was the epiphany moment. And I expected the epiphany moment to be lots of love and re, just fun times, memories, uh, connecting with my mom and sister and it would, intimacy. It was, and all that happened. But boy, did God hit me like a two by four across the head when I was uh, realizing I don't like me. But then as she kept reading, it was the season when I met Jesus. And you could see it in my writing. You could see it in my, in my countenance, the way I described people, the way I treated people. It was night and day. And I, and I knew I had a conversion over a season of time. I didn't have a momentary conversion. I had a season of conversion as I read the Gospels. And, and really, because I'm more intellectual and like to break, prove it, you know, kind of stuff. And so it hasn't always been heavily emotion for me. But boy, did it. Oh, it was just hit me like a ton of bricks. I was not nice. But here's, this is, this is it. Jesus was a friend and is a friend of tax collectors and sinners, of people who are hypocritical, people who are messy, who know what they should do and they shouldn't, and they don't do it. And, and listen to this. I want to give you some names. Glenn Ireland, Ken Kaler, Doug Bowden, Rich and Pam Suchecki, Vic Serbens. 99.9% .9 of you have no idea who those names are. But every one of those people have one thing in common. They were a friend of this sinner. They saw, all of them knew me during my ugly, self-centered, mean-spirited, cocky, um, arrogant, and um, sarcastic, self-centered spirit. They knew me then. And I had no idea how they were just loving me. Every one of them were safe. And every one of them entered my life. Glenn always asked about school. Ken took me skiing and, and played tennis with me. Uh, Rich and Pam were willing to hear my girl problems. And, uh, and Vic would ask me theological questions with no judgment. And I had no idea. Doug loved to talk about sports. Every one of them entered into my world as my world was. And I guarantee every one of them prayed for me without ceasing. They probably were in their small groups going, Woo, that Kenny is tough. <laughs> Woo. And then they gather back into the world and meet with me and connect with me and care for me and love on me and enter my world as is. And God used them to connect me to the, to the life-giving, life-forever-changing Spirit of God. I'm forever grateful they were a friend of this sinner. And I'm inviting you to do the same thing. You know who I'm talking about right now. There's people in your life that are just messy. And maybe you're one of those messy people and people are pouring, you're like, I'm on to them now. They've got their secret cult. I see what they're doing behind closed doors during church. And you're seeing our, our secret society talk if you, that's your image of church. But I hope you hear my heart. We're just following our Savior. We follow the Savior of the world who is a friend of sinners. Are you kidding me? Not a judgmental spirit of condemnation. Authority over sinners. He's a friend. He loves us as we are so that we can open up our hearts to him and he can invite us onto the journey that has changed my life forever. And I pray this is the greatest party you ever get to be a part of. And so I invite you onto this journey and this challenge. And I pray that you'll have the courage to be like these people I just described. My mentor, uh, Will, uh, from years ago, for 25 years, at different times we've met during different seasons, he's prayed for me and coached me a lot. Um, he just recently retired and, and was a pastor all these years. For the past 10, 15 years, he goes to a local bar. 
and he just keeps going to that same bar, same time every week. He's not a drinker. He doesn't, he doesn't care about any of that stuff. He just hangs out and knows all the people by name. He's done many funerals. He's done lots of counseling sessions. He visits them in the hospital. He just loves on them because God called him to this little dive of a, of a bar and he just pours into them and loves on them and he's just, that's what this is. He's, he's literally at a Matthew party every single week, a Levi party. It's beautiful. And so I'm asking you to just listen to what God is prompting in your spirit. Where is a natural network of connections that you just feel, they kind of like me and I kind of like them and we're kind of different spiritually. But boy, I just want to hang with them. I'm giving you permission to just hang out with them and I'm giving you permission to just enjoy them. And to trust by faith that God is going to open their heart at the right time. And maybe, just maybe, you're going to be the one that will get to invite them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I'm giving you permission to just be a nice, friendly, loving, kind person in people's presence. You don't have to feel the pressure and the anxiety of it all. Just love them. That is what we learn from this incredible party that Jesus attended. Let's, uh, let's pray. I'll invite the band to come out and we'll sing this last song together. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for the, the mission that you've given us so many years ago at, at Cornerstone here that we will know you deeply and that we will help make you known to this world. And I pray for anyone who just, they just struggle uh, to maybe they feel a lot of judgment in their heart toward other people's behavior. I just pray that you just help calm them because you are the Holy Spirit of God. You are the one who will bring conviction you're the one that will bring any of the change and you'll bring all of the sense of, of transformation that comes. As you've done in, I hope and I pray, anybody who here is hearing my voice, I pray you've done that with every single one of us. But if there's even one person today that has not taken that step to follow you, I pray that something has happened in their heart and they feel that we are friends. And we love them and we want to walk with them and, and journey with them. I pray that they'll have the courage to say, Jesus, could you even love me? And I pray that they'll have the courage to then just say, God, forgive me. I want to follow you. So I, I pray, God, that every single one of us will leave this place or maybe those tuning in online right now, I pray that they'll just have the, the courage to pray this prayer that, Jesus, I want to follow you. And thank you for loving me, a, a sinner. And you will turn me into a healthy and whole person by your Spirit's touch. And I pray for those of us, God, that are ready to be on mission to make you known. I pray that you'll give us a spirit of love, a spirit of receiving just a sense of friendship with people, and that they will feel our just unconditional care and support, that they too will one day want to ask why we follow you, and we'll have the power and the joy to share your story. And so, Jesus, thank you for the mission. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for the party that you love to always attend that your VP, VIP list is scandalous, and that includes me at the party. So you have, you have saved me, and I thank you for that. I pray that is every one of our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.